Buonasera, benvenuti in tanti, felicemente costato alla, alla conferenza della professoressa Mary Case. È davvero un grande piacere, un privilegio, un privilegio grandissimo averla qui perché eh, la professoressa porta avanti, che è una neuropatologa, porta avanti da tempo mh, un, un ambito di studi mh, Uh, un, un particolare segmento di studi relativi al microbioma intestinale che sta facendo fiorire veramente uh, nuove vie della ricerca e sta uh, di, facendoci così apparire uh, davanti agli occhi mh, interessantissimi mh, panorami relativi alla genesi di molte malattie che uh, fino a, 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 a almeno a un decennio fa immaginavamo avessero uh, come come dire, tutta altra potenziale origine. Eh, abbiamo sempre saputo, in, in, o coloro che, che, che sono medici, che sono biologi, che sono eh, microbiologi, chimici, che il nervo vago ha, eh, come dire, un ascensore tra il cervello e l'intestino. Eh, gli studi della professoressa Case hanno messo, hanno, come dire, messo in modo particolarmente innovativo a fuoco eh, la relazione tra i microorganismi eh, eh, dell'intestino e, 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 e ha messo a fuoco soprattutto le, le interazioni fra di essi e, e i viaggi e gli esiti che queste interazioni e loro stessi fanno ehm, verso il cervello e, e altrove. Prego. Thank you for coming today. Can you all hear me okay? Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to speak to you about microbiota and behavior today. And uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about me. This is my family. I am a retired anatomic and clinical pathologist and a neuropathologist by training. I am also a retired staff neuroscientist for Emergenetics International. I was born and live in the USA, and I'm very grateful to be among such incredible speakers here today. So this is my husband, Dr. Case. This is my daughter, Dr. Case. This is our son-in-law, Dr. Magawe, and this is our other daughter, Dr. Case. Education was very important in uh, this family. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about this talk that many of you have pieces of information about the microbiota, but not the whole picture. To me, it is a fundamental new reality of how I think of myself as a human being. Because instead of just being focused on the nature outside of me, I'm focused on the nature inside of me. I think that the biggest challenge is to understand exactly how the brain and the gut are speaking to each other. So I have these key concepts which I've gathered for you. Uh, first of all, there is no standard human healthy gut microbiota. These are the types of bacteria that are usually present in 90% of humans that in, in their colon, but they're not always the same numbers in proportion to each other. And many bacteria uh, provide uh, the same function from human being to human being. So you may have one kind of bacteria in you digesting butyrates, and it may be a different kind of bacteria performing the same function. I'm telling you this because that's why biotic treatment does not work for every patient for every diagnosis right now, and I think that's a key thing to remember. The second thing is that the way that the brain and the gut-brain axis talk is through the immune system, and it's bidirectional and What you need to remember only about the immune system is that there are two kinds of immune system families and they're cytokine products. There are inflammatory fam families of immune system cells and anti-inflammatory, and when they are in balance, then you're healthy. And when they get out of balance for any reason, that's called dysbiosis or uh, disease. The general animal model for these microbiota studies is the germ-free mouse, 
who is bred, born, and lives in a completely microbial-free environment. And it's really a bad kind of thing to have because they have all sorts of brain deficits, structural and physiological, that they're born with. If you haven't studied uh, the uh, brain for a while, it's no longer believed to uh, be immune privileged. There are things that get in and out through the blood-brain barrier endothelium, and it does have immune system cells in order to fight uh, uh, infection. And clues you may have overlooked, in case you're new to this subject, there are a lot of brain diseases with gastrointestinal symptoms. There are a lot of GI diseases or gastrointestinal uh, diseases that have a compression of depression or anxiety or cognitive decline along with them. Also, microbiota are older than us. They are uh, at least a billion and a half years older than us. They've been around longer and we adapted to them rather than the other way around. If you were a space alien looking down on a human body, you would say that the human body is more bacterial than human because there are 30 trillion human cells in your body and there are 40 trillion microorganisms in your gut microbiota alone. So it's a 1 to 1.3 ratio, and we're only talking about one kind of organism in one microbiota. Uh, and the influence on our behavior, it may just be a side effect of them living their lives uh, with us. So those are the key concepts that I wanted to start with so that we uh, are starting from the same place. This is what we will cover today. We'll uh, introduce the microbiota with uh, specific definitions. We'll define what the gut-brain axis is. We'll look at the microbiota and behavior, the microbiota and disease. And then one uh, significant human clinical trial that I want to mention because it's evidence-based with a good population about depression, anxiety, and antibiotics, and then a few, few points at the end about what the next frontiers are. Everybody ready to go? Okay. So this is introduction to the gut microbiota, and these are the two most important definitions. The definition of microbiota is all of the one-celled organisms, mainly bacteria, simply because that's the one we know the most about. Uh, that are on every surface of our bodies, inside and out, and are linked to a variety of healthy settings, behavioral effects, and disease. The gut mi microbiota modulates behavior by connecting the neuroendocrine and immune systems through direct and indirect mechanisms. The microbiome is the genome of all the organisms in the microbiota. When you read about this, they, they sometimes use the term interchangeably. They are different. One is the organisms and one is the genome. Here are the other key definitions. First, the two metas, the metagenome, which is the collective uh, genetic material in one sample. This is a big change. We can look at one sample, figure out by DNA sequencing exactly what number and kinds of organisms are present. And since we've had metagenomic testing, we have identified 2,000 more species of bacteria. The metabiome refers to the uh, collective metabolites in a sample because sometimes it's the metabolite of a microbiota which actually cues the immune system rather than the organism. Then there are the two holos, holobiont, which is the ecological units composed of different species. All of us are holobionts because we are living in commensal or symbiotic relationships with all of our microbiota. Holobiome is the equivalent, the uh, genetic material of the host um, and the, uh, the other microbiomes. Dysbiosis, as I mentioned, refers to um, changes, uh, disequilibrium, loss of balance in the number and kinds of bacteria in the gut microbiota, and it essentially equals disease. 
Entrotype is an attempt to classify humans based on the type of and number of organisms they have in their gut microbiota. And this is not proven to be a success yet. Uh, while it is true that most of the time, 90% of the microbiota is two major types of bacteria, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, rounded out by Proteobacteria, Actinobacteria, Fusobacteria, and Veruca, Veruca microbia, there again is no standard healthy human microbiota template. The last three terms are probably the ones that you are most familiar with, prebiotics, probiotics, and psychobiotics. Prebiotics are ingredients that you would ingest to feed the beneficial bacteria in your system. Probiotics are actual live microorganisms that you would use to nourish your gut. Your gut. And psychobiotics are either prebiotics or probiotics that are believed to have a mental health effect. So let's look at uh, one thing, which is the difference between our gene genome, which is between 20 and 25,000 genes, and the gut microbiome, which is 3.3 million genes. They make some of our essential vitamins. They make uh, eight of our 20 essential amino acids. They can make, in some cases, neurotransmitters. And um, they are uh, really... Uh, able to influence us, we could not survive without them. So this is a list on the right side of at least some of the other microbiotas. Again, we're only talking about one type of organism in our gut microbiota, but there are a lot of other ones, and uh, I'm sure there'll be more research coming in the future. This is where the gut microbiota lives. It's in this green segment, which is about one and a half meters long, uh, the colon. It's a very dark place, and it's oxygen-free, and the microbiota live in the mucus lining of the inside of the colon. The gut microbiota is invisible. And it, it's about three, it's about 1.4 kilograms, or three pounds, in weight, so it weighs about the same amount as your brain. Some of you are thinking, wait a minute, it's not invisible because the gut microbiota is all about sampling stool or fecal material. That's the non-invasive way of looking at the microbiota because, again, we are looking at the metagenome and determining by DNA segments what organisms are living in the mucus. In animals, we are sampling directly the mucus from the cecum, but not in humans. <clears throat> there are so many things to study about the microbiome, <laughs> microbiota. And on the, right, on the left, I have a list of, on the left, I have a list of the input connections. And on the right, excuse me for my technical challenges here. And on the right uh, are output connections. And we'll talk about most of everything on the right. And uh, let's move on to exactly what the gut-brain axis is. I have this uh, cartoon on this slide which says gutsy move for a brain in a game of chess because there is not one image I can show you that is proportionate for all of the parts of the gut-brain axis. That being said, here's a picture. And uh, this is... The, this is the brain, this is the colon, which is where the gut microbiota is, and these are the microbiota organisms themselves. It is bi-directional from gut to brain and from brain to gut for uh, the messaging getting across. So now let's look specifically at what the messaging actually is. Uh, if we look at the, how the gut brain, how the gut microbiota influences the brain, it's through the immune system in three major ways. The microbiota themselves, the microbiota elements, and the microbiota metabolites. So for example, if we're really looking at microbiota, two examples are the Bacteroides fragilis, which promotes Th1 immune cells, and that would be in a pro-inflammatory way. Uh, Clostridium, another microbiota, promotes T 
differentiation, and that is uh, um, softening the immune response. Examples of microbiota elements that can cue the immune system are flag flagellin, which is the main filament protein in modal bacteria that have flagellum, uh, sh um, uh, lipopolysaccharides, which are in the wall of gram-negative bacteria, and something called microbial-associated uh, molecular pattern system, which are bacterial antigens that the immune system recognizes. It can also be the metabolites of microbiota that interact with the immune system and cue the cells. For example, short-chain fatty acids, which have an anti-inflammatory effect, or long-chain fatty acids, which call up pro-inflammatory immune cells. The brain influences the gut in the powerful neurological mechanisms that it possesses through autonomic pathways, through neuroendocrine system, and through the vagus nerve and the release of different cytokines and hormones. So being a pathologist, this next slide is my favorite because it shows on the right specific areas in the brain that are affected uh, and are influenced by the microbiota. So hippocampus, amygdala, um, prefrontal cortex, and hypothalamus. And on the left, it shows you what it really looks like. So uh, we have the brain here, the vagus nerve, which ends in small branches within the gastrointestinal tract, the enteric nervous system, which is part of the autonomic nervous system, a very powerful system. Uh, there are actually more neurons in the gut than there are in the spinal cord. And we used to think that was because of peristalsis. Uh, now we know that those neurons have the full complement of neurotransmitters. So there is very intimate connection between the brain and the gut and the immune system. This is a cross-section of the colon here and uh, the lumen of the colon where the gut microbiota live. And this is a closer up view of the lining cells of the colon. And you see in this picture and in this picture the tremendous uh, representation by neurons, which are the yellow star-shaped cells. I've been talking a lot about lymphocytes and the immune system. They're not pictured in this, but they would be completely filling all of this yellow area underneath the lining of the colon. There are more immune cells within the gut than there are in the organs that we traditionally consider as immune system organs, lymph nodes, spleen, and bone marrow. And there's one other thing, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the feedback loop for uh, production of uh, cortisol and stress. That's another significant influence on this, how this system works. I want to mention a little bit more about the vagus nerve because uh, for you uh, philosophers, we have two each. Uh, you always talk about the vagus nerve, but it's actually the left and the right. There's two of them, and they're coming from the base of the brain. They're, uh, it's a their cranial nerves. The vagus is, as I mentioned before, directly uh, connected to the gut, and it has regulatory effects on local immunity and inflammation, and the uh, tightness of the junctions in the lining of the gut. And another thing is bacterial metabolites cue gut epithelial enteroendocrine cells, which are lining uh, in the small bowel via immune system cells. Uh, in this case, uh, toll-like receptors, and in response to the immune system cells, the, uh, the EEC cells reduce, uh, release their hormones directly to the vagus nerve. So this is 5-hydroxytryptophan for uh, serotonin metabolism and uh, cholecystokinin for appetite and uh, peptide tyrosine, tyrosine for society, satiety. And so that's another way that the gut communicates directly with the brain. I think that's really exciting. So let's look specifically at behavior. So this is a flow diagram which shows exactly what we've been talking about. You start out with the microbes, the microbial elements, and the metabolites, and you end up with effects on um, behavior and pathology. And what we've said is that any three of these elements um, can, can cue uh, 
elements in the bacteria which, uh, for example, we mentioned flagellin and lipopolysaccharides and short-chain fatty acids. Once they get cued, once they uh, trigger, uh, they're triggering immune system cells and uh, innate or adaptive immune system cells, and that gets the whole immune system involved. That doesn't necessarily just happen in disease. This is happening all the time where all these 14 trillion uh, bacteria are triggering uh, immune system response. And there's this amazing equilibrium that's going on in health, which really is a tribute to how complicated and beautiful our bodies and brain are. Once the immune system cells are cued, they're either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, and they cue the cellular products, uh, the chemical products, the cytokines and the chemokines that further uh, directly or indirectly cue nerve cells. Um, and so here are some examples of them. Interferon, uh, tissue necrosis factor. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry. They cue the... Uh, nerve system directly through the vagus nerve and the brain and the entero, uh, uh, the enteric nervous system. Once neurotransmitters are involved, you have the whole cadre of whatever nerve has been stimulated uh, and they produce the neurotransmitters that they can and then that's where the behavior comes in. It's just that it started out with microbiota. So the list of behaviors that have been reported in laboratory animals to be connected to microbiota include aggression, curiosity, learning, memory, and sociability. And the pathologies that have been connected with directly being caused by microbiota are addiction, anxiety, and depression. So let's look specifically about what that means. So what kind of behaviors are we talking about? Across kingdoms, the single most important type of communication is chemical. And uh, the microbiota inf influence through the production of volatile chemicals and metabolites which make foraging, mating, and territorial marking easier. I'm talking specifically about pheromones and farting. So uh, examples are uh, sterile German cockroaches who are not attractive to uh, potential mates because they have low levels of a microbiota produced volatile fecal carboxylic acid. If you add control microbiota to the gut of these cockroaches, that goes away and they are restored to being attractive to potential mates. It doesn't affect their uh, infertility, however. Fruit flies always appreciate uh, and find more attractive mates that are on the same diet as they are. And if you treat with antibiotics, you eliminate that preference. In humans, skin microbiota are linked to different odorant profiles, but the precise behavioral uh, consequences of that are not completely understood. So here is a poor germ-free mouse. Uh, I've found that this picture is sometimes a little bit intriguing to interpret, but let's start with the list on the right. Germ-free mice who have been bred and born and live in a completely germ-free environment have structural and physiological abnormalities in their brain from birth. Over here is a picture of at least eight areas in the brain which are either abnormal or deficient. This is the uh, snout of the animal. This is one of uh, the left ear, this is the right ear, and this is the brain superimposed on the head of the germ-free mouse. So let's continue with other kinds of behavior. Microbiota can modify social and communicative behavior in animals. For example, germ-free mice are social introverts. They're born social introverts. They are, they are not um, uh, normal in how they relate to their community. So um, if you add normal microbiota to them, they become normally social. This is an example of one of the personality transplants that you read about when you read about microbiota. 
Uh, the second study, uh, this one, is pregnant mice that were fed a high-fat diet, and their offspring had an abnormality in their microbiota, which wasn't so surprising. The thing that was surprising was that they were also social introverts. And you can either add normal microbiota or add the specific one that's missing, and they became normally social. A uh, precise mechanism for that isn't worked out. Social behavior among uh, animals or among us also adds to similarities between our microbiota. Chimps that play and socialize together have similarities. And you and your pet, if we were to look at your respective my microbiotas compared to other humans and their pets, we would be able to pick out your two because of the similarities. This is a stressor-induced behavior, and I specifically mention it because I think it has application to humans, even though it hasn't been worked out in humans. And it has to do with pain sensitivity. Um, uh, many chronic diseases are associated with alterations in pain sensitivity. In animal models, microbiota are linked to this, to both visceral and peripheral pain hypersensitivity. Uh, in uh, animals, antibiotic-treated mice have lower threshold to pain, and adding a lactobacillus strain to their microbiota normalizes pain receptors. Some of you may be on recurrent antibiotic therapy, or you may be treating patients who have a chronic disease with uh, antibiotics for, their, for infections. And maybe uh, when you notice that there's a change in pain threshold, instead of assuming that it's purely neurological and related to factors of the chronic disease, consider that this might be related to the gut microbiota. This is cognitive behavior and how the microbiota affects cognitive behavior. Um, in animal studies, Changes in the composition and diversity of microbiota can affect brain physiology. For example, germ-free mice, the poor animals that we talked about before, uh, they have an altered uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which again is the feedback uh, control mechanism for production of cortisol and stress response. And they, they have an increased baseline for the system to be activated and a higher level of cortisol, so it's even stronger than what um, their normal counterparts would have. They also have um, inborn um, memory deficits of both major kinds, which does not get better under stress. And they have deficiencies in two uh, neurotrophic factors that have to do with uh, improvement in memory. One human study that I can mention is that they uh, fed humans a, uh, pro a probiotic cocktail for 30, 30 days, and it, before starting it and after ending it, they took some baseline uh, self, self blame surveys and problem solving surveys and found that after a month of the uh, cocktail that they blamed themselves less for outcomes and they had a higher problem solving score consistent with it uh, with the cocktail affecting their cognition let's look at microbiota and disease dysbiosis from any kind um, has physiologic brain implications uh, we mentioned that the germ-free uh, uh, mice have problems in learning, memory, recognition, and emotions, and they have neurotransmitter abnormalities. Um, microglia, which are cells in the brain that are macrophages, um, in germ-free mice don't mature uh, in a normal way, and so they're not as effective um, as they would be in a normal mouse. That's called naive um, and if you either treat a normal mice with antibiotics, you can increase the numbers of naive uh, microglia. Or in germ-free mice, if you add short-chain fatty acids, which is one of the metabolites we mentioned, you can, you can have the microglia mature more normally. So they are directly affecting that particular population. 
Uh, germ-free mice also have abnormal blood-brain barrier, and it's been shown that in animals, some bacteria that are colonized can restore the uh, impermeability, relatively impermeable blood-brain barrier, while others uh, can cause problems. So I'm going to talk for the final thing about five brain diseases that are affected by microbiota. The first one is autism spectrum disorder. And I want to say that there is no signature uh, autism spectrum disorder microbiota, but they commonly have microbiota uh, abnormalities. And so that's why in some patients at some point in time, um, antibiotics or probiotic therapy can be affected for symptoms. The second disease is major depressive disorder. Uh, patients with major depressive disorder have changes in two kinds of bacteria in their microbiota. In mice, in the germ-free animal model, uh, you can actually transplant microbiota from human patients with major depressive disorders and cause the equivalent depression symptoms in the animal. And it's accompanied by alterations in uh, hippocampal metabolism in the brain. Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease has a particular set of symptoms. It has particular changes in the brain which involve uh, loss of neurons in a couple of specific areas and deposition of alpha-synuclein uh, in other areas. And uh, these are called Lewy bodies when you see them under the microscope. And um, a couple of interesting things about Parkinson's disease. The symptoms related to posture, uh, which there's a specific posture uh, usually with Parkinson's disease, and the gait, which is a kind of particular shuffling gait, is linked to Enterobacteriaceae in the gut of those patients. And we're finding more often that dysbiosis signals the onset of Parkinson's disease symptoms. Many patients, six weeks to two months before the onset of Parkinson's system, have a major gut dysbiosis, sometimes, uh, sometimes um, uh, requiring hospitalization. And it's almost like the gut is saying there's something wrong with the brain. Uh, in animals, there in the germ-free animals, you can induce Parkinson's symptoms by uh, overexpression of the alpha-synuclein um, uh, uh, protein, and uh, you can induce um, the symptoms through the immune system, and you can also induce the same symptoms with um, uh, microbes. So there does seem to be a direct connection between uh, Parkinson's disease and some microbiota in, in the human system. Multiple sclerosis is a pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory disease that uh, causes demyelination of uh, uh, the white matter. And there is an animal model for multiple sclerosis. It's called EAE, which is experimental autoimmune encephalitis. And in animals, the um, symptoms can be induced with, uh, T, uh, with CD4 plus T cells. And the same reaction can be induced uh, through the same pathway causing the same symptoms with um, certain segmented filamentous bacteria in an in vitro kind of a setting. If you give antibiotics, you can reduce the the uh, disease severity through the complementary immune system reaction. MS patients uh, may have elevated numbers of certain kinds of bacteria, and if you transplant those bacteria to the EAE mice, it worsens their symptoms. Uh, treatment, uh, this is just a side uh, issue, treatment of, uh, for MS patients with a probiotic VSL Three, that uh, is known to be a benefit in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, can increase uh, specific beneficial bacteria and uh, decrease symptoms. So sometimes that's tried with a positive effect. 
Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, dementia in the elderly, and it's characterized in the brain by deposition of tau protein and beta amyloid. Those are the plaques and tangles in the neurons of patients that have this kind of dementia. And um, the uh, deposition of uh, the amyloid, the alpha amyloid protein, uh, mediates through a pro-inflammatory mechanism and a whole host of cytokinins. And interestingly enough, uh, those symptoms are also associated with uh, herpes simplex virus type 1 infection and some microbes, so that, that pathway is not exactly clear. In the animal model for al Alzheimer's disease, um, chronic broad-spectrum antibiotics decreases the amount of beta amyloid that's being deposited and secondarily reduces symptoms. Um, and also there are some other uh, microbial abnormalities in Alzheimer's disease. So that's a set of CNS or brain diseases that are always associated in humans with some gut microbiota influence in their behavior and their symptomatology. And it's through the immune system. So this is one clinical trial I want to tell you about because it's a, it's a great population-based study. And it's looking at odds ratio of developing anxiety or depression simply by taking one uh, course of antibiotics. So the odds ratio is saying, if I'm exposed to one thing, does that make me at risk for something else? They tested nine different kinds of antibiotics. So this is the results of just what penicillin showed. So this is taking antibiotics for any reason in patients who had no evidence of clinical anxiety or depression. And after one round of penicillins, uh, normal odds ratio was one. After one round of penicillin, the odds ratio was uh, increased to 1.23. Between two and five, it increased to 1.4. And over five rounds, it was at 1.56. So that means that there is a direct risk for anxiety or depression simply by taking antibiotics. In um, the United States, by the time a child is 20, they've had at least 17 rounds of antibiotics, and sometimes it's broad-spectrum antibiotics. Or you think about teenagers that get put on antibiotics for acne. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying uh, yes or no. I'm saying to be aware of that side effect, if uh, that risk, if you are a patient who's who's taken for good reason or whatever, multiple rounds of antibiotics, or if you are treating a patient uh, with multiple rounds of antibiotics, consider the fact that if anxiety or depression shows up, that it may be related to the antibiotic itself. The next frontiers uh, include um, personalized medicine, which uh, Everybody is going to have now a uh, personalized medicine profile, and your gut microbiota will be one of the uh, components of that. It helps look at ri risk asse assessment, what uh, treatments might be effective, and what kind of diseases that you're at risk for. The second thing is nutraceutical strategies, which are putting things in uh, your gastrointestinal tract that will optimize or uh, create enzymes for beneficial bacteria. I think this is way overdone. I think, as you've seen, there's no evidence, there's no standard uh, healthy gut microbiota, and that's why th all, all things don't work on all patients. I think, I know also that as long as you're on the probiotic or the prebiotic, you can change the numbers of beneficial bacteria, but there really is not a way to permanently change your microbiota. So I would say that if you are having good results from it, make sure that you're not spending a lot of money on it. I think that we have a lot to learn, and we're just on the brink of really being able to use uh, nutraceutical strategies. The third thing, synth synthetic biology, I really do like, because that's engineering. Engineering probiotics to get anti-HIV antibodies down to the gut, uh, cre uh, curing inborn errors of metabolism, for example, phenylalanine metabolites, 
for uh, phenylketonuria or uh, curing uh, Gaucher's disease by hooking on glu glucocerebrosidase enzyme. For my last slide, I have a new term. And we all know what in vivo, studying an organism uh, in their native environment, in vitro, studying an organism in the laboratory. We now have a new term, in FEMO. And in FEMO is uh, a scientific and philosophy philosophical term of choice per these wonderful philosophers for the experimental examination of excrement. Thank you all holobionts here. <laughs>
However, I think that there are people who've had periods of time in their life when they're on a lot of antibiotic therapy, particularly when they're younger, that they have changed their microbiota. And so as they get older, even if they're healthy, they would have more symptoms related to uh, the gut microbiota system. Uh, if you look at the beginning of life, uh, the, our immune system and our gut microbiota develop at the same time. And a long time ago when we were subjected to a diversity of uh, microorganisms, it became easy to differentiate between the good microbiota and the bad ones that causes disease. Now, because of changes in sanitation and our diet, and our antibiotic therapy, and our age, and our gender, and where we live, we have relatively naive immune systems. And something like a simple allergen, like a peanut, if a child is exposed to that, they can't tell. Uh, their immune system is so underdeveloped that they can't tell whether it's a potential pathogen. And we have this whole immune response which explains, and it's a hypothesis about why we're seeing so much more autoimmune disease. And I always wonder about people as they age when they've had a lot of allergies and a lot of antibiotic treatments in their life, how that will be uh, when they get old. So I can't tell you specifically an answer to your question, but I, like you, I see the warning signs of it's not gonna be better than it is now. Thank you for your question. Very, very good, very Thank interesting. You. A little question. Is there a relationship between physical activity and microbiota? Good answer. I think related to what your nutrition is. I think that if you're in good physical shape and an athlete, more times you have a good diet. And, and it's the good diet, it's what you're putting into your gut. I, I think that that would be the link. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific study, but that would be my speculation, except for the athletes who kind of go overboard with eating a lot of supplements and, and not, not being adequately hydrated. But that's, that's a great thought, yeah. I, I would think that they would just jump on the bandwagon of a good diet. And, and there is uh, some difference between men and women in macrobiotic. Uh, I haven't seen that. Uh. That's a good question. I haven't seen that distinguished by gender. And um, I, I'll, look, I'll look into that and I'll send you something because I'm sure somebody has tried, but I know it hasn't reached the level of being a, a clinically based evidence controlled trial. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Altre domande? I, I wonder what can be the influence of microbiota on free will, if that is not just a delusion. I think we've just gone into philosophy. I think there is, because the uh, neurotransmitters are mood and sociability, and uh, I wouldn't find that a hard stretch uh, conceptually. I obviously would be very skeptical as a scientist. Um, I'm not sure about free will at all. I, I think we don't have it, and, and maybe blaming it on microbiota will be the perfect escape for me. <laughs> but very good question. Thank yeah, you. I, think, I think definitely consciousness and our mind um, are affected by microbiota. I can't prove it, though. Thank you. Uh -huh. I, am, I am so honored to be here, and I really appreciate your attention and your excellent questions today. Thank you very much.